is a science and yeah. I'm not very scientific. All right, welcome. Welcome, everybody, to the Tech Social first one of the 2017 season. Um, we're actually, it's, it's season 11. This is episode 130? 131. Hard to believe we've done that many. Uh, it's my pleasure tonight that we have uh, Jeremy White from Big Spruce. Uh, it's not really a tech story, but fear is close to every tech startup, so we thought it would be very appropriate to hear Jeremy's story about entrepreneurship and how we got how we got here in Cape Breton, how we started the business, and uh, hopefully it'll shed some light on his recent uh, expansion as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to, to Jeremy. Awesome. That's great. Carol? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Excellent. So, has everybody here had my beer before? Yeah. Anybody not had my beer before? Liars. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, for those of you that uh, don't know much about me, uh, I own, along with my wife, uh, Big Proof Brewing. It's a certified organic on farm. Uh, craft brewery and hop yard. We also do a little bit of other farming there. Uh, located in the thriving metropolis of Nyanza, Cape Breton. Population 34. Maybe 35 now with my little daughter. Um, we're right at the bottom of the Yankee Line, right near the starting and end point of the Cabot Trail there. What well, used to be called Buckley Corner, but it's now referred to more commonly as where the Red Barn is. Um, my wife and I bought our farm. You haven't heard the story, sight unseen off the internet in 2008. We had been here in the summer of that year on our honeymoon, uh, half scoping out the East Coast a little bit. At the time, we were both living and working in uh, Managua, Nicaragua, of all places. I had been there, well, not just in Managua, but in the Latin American region for about 13 years. Uh, I had met Melanie down there. She had been studying Spanish. We were very close to a uh, a decision to get back to Canada, she being from Vancouver, me from Toronto, long story, la da la da. Um, just felt we couldn't afford out of those two places. We didn't feel there was a lot of good value for money and any of the stuff we wanted to do. And kind of at the core of what we wanted to do was own a piece of land in Canada, um, take care of it, try to figure out a way we could uh, do something with the land. Um, that led us here on our honeymoon. So lo and behold, four months or so later, after our honeymoon, where, where we had, had had a great, great time, um, we got into perusing MLS listings uh, here in Cape Breton, always looking for things over packages over 50 acres, uh, and all, always, embarrassingly, listing them, filtering them from cheapest to most expensive. Uh, and uh, in about October of 2008, uh, one of my perusals sitting at my boring desk on a construction site in Managua, Nicaragua, um, had the listing for the farm we now own, uh, second cheapest, um, <laughs> that, that week. Um, and it just led me, I think, spur the moment to pick up the phone and call the agent in Bedeck, Karen McDonald. I asked her a little bit about the package. Uh, she gave me some information. I said, let me speak to my wife. She's away right now, traveling with her family in Vancouver. Um, and I'll get back to you. Maybe you could you know, send me a few more links to some pictures and stuff like that. She said, well, I don't want you to see this as a sales guy. It's no pressure or anything, but the place is being sold by the, the province. The provincial trustee has to sell it because the old guy died. No will, no heirs in the province. Um, it's a really good price. And you've got two offers already today, and I'm duty bound to take them to the provincial trustee. Um, so if you want to play, you got to give an offer by 4 o'clock. Oh. And I said, Sure, I'm calling you from my desk in Managua, Nicaragua, and I've never seen the package of, of land before in my life. She said, oh, Managua, Nicaragua. I don't think I've ever had a phone call from there before. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you probably never will again. Um, anyways, long story short, um, I called Melanie, asked her to sit down first. And just something about 
the listing, the photos, uh, probably also something to do with my yearning to get out of what I was doing professionally down there, uh, which was running big job sites for a construction and engineering firm, led us to take a total plunge, put an offer in on this place, same day, site on scene, 24 hours later, we had an accepted price, and two months later, we were, nearly two months later, we were up here getting the keys to a an old house which was originally sold to us as a teardown, um, but which we found a way to uh, make uh, survive uh, through extensive renovation. <laughs> and uh, thank you. And uh, then we uh, hello. Hi. Sorry, we're late. That's all right. She's re when I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, lo and behold, uh, New Year's, it was actually uh, Boxing Day 2008, we came up to get those keys. And we're owners of this uh, house that required all sorts of investment and 75 acres of land. Fast forward a little more to 2010, I finally left my job. Uh, we came traveling back to Canada with three dogs, all of our belongings, nowhere really to put them, so we moved them into this old place in, uh, in Cape Breton. And then we kind of took our time for a couple of years. Uh, I did a little headhunting to make ends meet, and we kind of started to think about what it was we were going to do. I had always been a home brewer. I had always been a lover of finely crafted uh, beers from around the world. I traveled with my construction and engineering firm to take me to all sorts of places, and I had dabbled in home brewing at all of these sorts of calls where I had uh, lived and worked. And even before I had, I had left Canada as well. And when I got to Nova Scotia, especially rural Cape Breton, I was appalled at the lack of food craft here. And that kind of led me to ramp up my home brewing. My ramped up home brewing led me to plant some pots. My planting of pots led me to following a hop farm and brewery in Sorrento, British Columbia. Canada's only other certified organic on-farm craft brewery for no gales. That following led to conversations with the owners. Conversations with the owners led me to somewhat stupidly believe I could start a brewery as well. Um, so in July, August of 2012, we broke ground on a little uh, 45 by 25 foot two-story building. Um, that we somehow thought was going to be big enough to put a brewery in. Uh, this is actually the commencement of wall construction on the second story. So if we got one thing right about this building and this business plan, it was the location for the building. The view is magnificent. Um, we embarked upon starting a brewery, uh, and we have in fact created a, a major tourist destination in, in Cape Breton, which was completely Unintended, honestly. Not even, didn't even cross our minds as something. We knew we'd be busier in the summer, but all breweries are. We just didn't know it would be such a, an oft visited place by tourists. This is us uh, by November, starting to worry about uh, weather coming. Actually, I don't think it was quite November. It was about September when we finally got to the rafters. So let's talk a bit about that ambitious uh, business plan. We thought initially. We take about three, maybe even five years to grow to about 80,000 liters annually in beer production. We thought it would be a challenge to get 50 people a week to come up our driveway and buy a growler. So our, if you go back to our original business plan, we were about 15% growler sales at our front door and 85% sales of kegs, mostly to Sydney and Halifax, driven by us across the province. We were only going to focus on two flagship rates. That rapidly got very boring for me as a brewer, so we ventured well away from that very early in our in our existence. Um, of note, we were license number 14. This was just end of 2012, beginning of 2013. Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation issued me the 14th uh, microbrewery manufacturer's permit in Nova Scotia. There's 43 now. Okay. Um, I talked openly about how I was never going to work with the NSLC. <laughs> I have to admit to that because it's kind of funny that we do now. Um, we still do it a little bit grudgingly, and I like to come out in the public and 
call them a piece of shit all the time. Uh, well, nobody's from the NSLC here. Uh, they aren't. They aren't actually that bad. They're world world class retailers of spirits, beer, and uh, wine. Um, they they just wouldn't know a craft beer if it jumped up and smacked them in the face. That's their that's their big problem. Um, we uh, we we had a focus in our business plan of uh, being on farm, being particular about quality of ingredients and quality of final product, and we wanted to be about face to face sales. So. If any of you happened to visit our establishment before we moved to the front of the building with our sales area, which, by the way, used to be my, we've been there, used to be my office, um, you would have known there was like a little gravel pathway up a hill beside a rock garden to our back door, which is where we had the sales desk. And when you walked in there, you literally walked into the brew board. So we'd be brewing right behind the sales desk, and we'd sort of step away from moving here into a pump and sell you a gravel. Um, that was intentional. That was put the consumer right next to the beer being made. Talk to them about the beer being made. You were going to walk into Big Spruce, you were going to trip over a hose, and then realize, hey, this is a blue collar place where they, they work real hard to make their beer. There's no touch button brewing here. Um, that was actually intentional. That was actually a very small thing that we got right because it resonated with our audience. We had an audience that starved for uh, good beer, starved for beer that was made in an interesting, particular, refined, crafty way. And it was immediately apparent when we walked into our location that we were all about that. So, we launched, sorry, they missed the G in governors, but uh, that was our launch party with Daryl Keegan on the, on, the, on the menu that night as well, too. Uh, I had a fancy photographer show up and for three growlers and took some nice pictures. <laughs> Still haven't, anybody knows of any fancy photographers? We could use an update to some of our PR pictures. Let's fast forward to now. It's been a crazy four years. 2013, three months after opening, um, we increased fermentation capacity by 50%. Right out of the gate, we couldn't keep up. We were starting to have weekends where we sold 50 growlers, not just our ambitious 50 growlers a week. By May 2014, we expanded by another 100%, doubling our tankage and increasing all our salary and quadrupling our uh, cooperage, so all of our kegs for uh, final destination here. To, uh, um, and then we were sort of in a, a holding pattern for a couple of years because we were stuck inside this ridiculously small space. And this is this is really where I like to pause for a minute and say, like, we get an awful lot of comments about how everything we did was perfect. Everything we did was right. Timing was great. Oh, you just got it all right. And if you read our business plan, you'd be like, holy shit, this guy got everything wrong. <laughs> it's very true. And the thing we got, the thing we got most wrong was we were completely unready for what kind of volume we could do as a business and what kind of volume we needed to do as a business to make, make the sort of income that wasn't going to make us rich, but was at least going to allow us to not have to close the business and go find a job somewhere else. So for a couple of years, all we could do was work on efficiencies. So we got creative with our styles. We would spend all winter when we couldn't quite sell all our beer. Um, expending on uh, rare and barrel-aged beers and tucking them away in bottles around the brewery so that we had more product to offer people when things got busy in the spring. Um, we got uh, very creative with how we moved beer through the brewery so as to optimize uh, its, uh, its uh, production on the back end. E even little things like just uh, reducing uh, hot true related loss in the fermenter uh, on racking. Um, you know, it was it's crazy. We, we developed a way to um, reduce that by like 25 liters, but that, that's, a, that's a 20 liter keg and then some, and a couple of growlers. And it was a huge difference to us. It just allowed us to kind of nip at the heels of demand in summer for the last couple of years. Um, and then this past winter, we really made our mark. We, we decided enough's enough. We bought the adjacent land to our farm, which once upon a time had ironically been part of our farm. So now it's been reincorporated back into the fold. Um, we built a five and a half thousand square foot building 
So a building that is uh, seven, seven, eight, eight times as big as our original roof floor. Uh, and we put in tankage and an independent 40 barrel roof house uh, that enabled us to increase overall production of our business by 300 more percent. Right out of the gate, projected demand at the NSLC was four times what they told us it would be. So in July, scan two, three months after we opened, we put in three more 40 barrel fermenters and we've increased by 75 percent just this summer. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, and for the first time since we started brewing on April 4th, I looked at our um, business plan for this expansion and our actual production uh, since April 4th in just the new 40 barrel facility. And we have, in fact, produced 303,000 liters as of uh, Tuesday of this week since April 4th. That's just in the big brewery. That doesn't include what we've done up top since uh, the beginning of the year in our smaller facility. So. Having tried to create a business that could grow from 150,000 liters a year in our original small facility to 350,000 liters a year with the added bigger facility, we're probably actually on target for about a half a million liters this year. So some stats. July 2017, look at our numbers for last, well, last completed month, but not quite completed, August yet, financially. Um, we did about 7,500 liters sold at our front door in cans and growlers. Now, if you look at that and, and imagine selling that on our original projected total, 7,500 liters times 12 months, that's, all, that's over 80,000 liters a year. That was what we were trying to embark upon selling in an entire calendar year out of just our small brewery, including all the kegs and everything else that we would send around the province. We sold that just at our front door out of a 16 by 16 foot former office um, up at Gravel Drive. Um, and it's all C sales, like I just said, four times projected. Uh, things have changed. I slagged them off very seriously when we first sold. They had no refrigeration for craft beer. In fact, when I went in to talk to them about listing with them, and I said, you know, Thanks for the attention to our listing. We're really looking forward to getting here. But you know what you really need is a, is a dedicated Nova Scotia craft beer section. And went up across to a very senior gentleman who I will not name. I said, Jeremy, we would never do that to you. And I said, I'm pretty sure I'm asking you to do it to me. I'd like, I'd like it to be done. I'd like a Nova Scotia craft beer section. Um, they felt, until just recently, it's this April, when they finally put a few dedicated sections in, they felt that by creating a separate section for Nova Scotia craft beer, people shopping for beer would walk right past it to the main beer section, and Nova Scotia craft beer section sales would go down. Funny line of thinking. They changed it. They changed it for the beginning of this most recent fiscal quarter for them. Uh, their year end is March 31st. So April, May, and June for them, craft beer sales at Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation, you probably just heard it, up 48% year on year. And that encompasses sales at the newly created, dedicated Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation, or sorry, Nova Scotia craft beer sections at, I think it's 42 of their stores, which by the way are also refrigerated. So back to my original point, I gave them a lot of heat long, many years ago. Many of my colleagues have been giving them the same heat. And many patrons of the NSLC echo that heat. They responded by finally, sluggishly, doing what people were asking for, and they're reaping the benefits. Nova Scotia Craft Beer is here to stay, um, and it is continues to be, other than Nova Scotia uh, Distilled Spirits and Nova Scotia Produced Wine, uh, the hottest segment at the NSLC for going on three years ago. Um, we are still, believe it or not, unable to keep up um, we've only got about three, four weeks inventory at the NSLC warehouse, which I actually kind of like. I like that we haven't been able to keep up. They want 10 weeks, but beer on a warm warehouse floor kind of goes stale after six or eight weeks, so I don't really want to give them that much. Um, but they still call for it on a frequency we cannot keep up with. Um, We'll see what we deal with that, how we deal with that in the winter. That's going to be a, a challenge for us. Um, we have 
impressively, I think, because that's something I'm proud of. 13 full-time employees now, five of them are women. Uh, and of the five senior management, including myself and Melanie, we're three women. Um, women really bring incredible perspective and um, dynamic things to uh, your business. Total, total opposite to I don't know, any person. Uh, the contribution from um, a lot of our male employees. It's great. 2016, we were uh, the most decorated uh, brewery at the Atlantic Canadian Beer Awards in our uh, Russian Imperial Stout that we barrel aged in the North Whiskey Barrels for five months, one beer of the year. Uh, in 2016, we were also the Tourism Nova Scotia Sustainable Tourism Business of the Year, which, like I said, I, was, I told them when they called me about that. I was just like, this is stupid. <laughs> They're, they're like, they're like, no, but we really, you know, you're, you're definitely, you're the, you're the model for the type of sustainable tourism business. I said, I'm going to be the model for a sustainable business, but you have to understand something. I never tried to be a tourism business. <laughs> so, anyways, something we're still pretty proud of. And there's been up, countless other recognitions. That it's, um, it's all nice, but you know what I, I love most about what we've done, other than great, great career. Create a nice little culture at the bottom of the end line. Great jobs for 13 people. I love that some of us consider a little bit of consider us to be a little bit of a model for other stuff that could happen on the side. I think too often perspective on the possibilities that lie up there are missed. Really missed. I've said something with Brady's. You got a cool idea you're really passionate about. And if a lot of people are looking at you, Telling you you are crazy, that is probably every indication that you need to keep charging ahead with what you're doing. Everybody told me I would fail. We're building a brewery in the middle of a former hay field in Niantic. I mean, you can't possibly get enough people up there to make it work. Um, but here we are, four plus years in, and you know, way, way ahead, two breweries instead of one. Um, you know, if you've ever been up on our weekend still plays there all the time. Uh, as part of the Elman, um, great man. Um, you know, they're, they've been part of that culture. The, the arrival of all sorts of people, the parking lot overflowing down on the Yankee line and into our parking lot across the street. Um, just uh, just great culture that's part of this overall umbrella of experiential tourism, slow local food, you know, and underneath it, hey, a nice plant of craft food to go with. Um, we are open seven days a week. Really, we've become quite a, a hit in this spot for tourism uh, in, uh, in the day run. And we're still also a good craft beer destination. So we get the we get the beer from crafties. We also get the uh, um, blue collar tourists from Ohio who just are paying attention to what's in all the groceries. It's a nice mix. Um, how did we do it? I don't know. Really, honestly, we did it because we're passionate about it. Um, and we got a lot of stuff wrong, but we got it wrong for a really good reason. So let me let me tell you about some of those reasons. We got a lot of unintended brand presence. I'll go right off the bat and explain to you that okay, yes, we, we drew a nice logo with a tree and some custom lettering under it that said big spruce. But when it came time to choosing colors, you ready for this? We were five days from launch, still just had it in black and white. We had no tap handles. And I was sitting lamenting that I wasn't going to have Brandon Tappings for my launch on a bar stool at the Bredore Yacht Club. Um, uh, Doug Rohn from, uh, from Protocase was next to me. He said, I think we can do those for you. I said, very mean for you. And, uh, <laughs> uh, what do you mean you think you can do those for me? And uh, so he explained, like, they do electronics enclosures. Um, yeah, it's just gold and metal. What if we folded something together for you in the shape of a box or something, you know, something we can do. And I said, yeah, but I need them in five days. We got our launch here at the Yacht Club. He's like, we promised a three day turnaround on small orders. No problem, we can do this. And here was the clincher. They did it, we got something designed up. They were gonna print the logo on it, great. We had to choose colors. They only had four in stock colors available. <laughs> <laughs> One was black, so we were gonna go with that. I think the others were like, you know, fire engine red and something else green and then this bright yellow. And really, it, it was like a serendipitous moment because we chose that because there really wasn't any other choice. Okay? 
But suddenly, it made us who we were. And for the first six months of our business, the number of comments we would get about people walking into bars, and from 180 feet away, being able to tell for sure that we were on tap. We couldn't tell who else was on top of it. You big spruce was on top. And that was just because I had a conversation with a guy at a bar, and it was like I walked right into our corporate color. I was just refined it a little bit. It is now the precise yellow it was that first day. But it still remains true that we, we walked into that completely by accident. And that happens all over the place when you have a startup. If you're passionate, you're paying attention to the things that make your product, your item, whatever it is you're doing, sellable, all sorts of other cool things kind of happen along the way, contribute to this momentum, which is really, really great. I'll give you some others. We, because my wife and I have been sort of eating like a couple of crazy tickets for years, our, our mantra was, in fact, before we even uh, certified organic brewery, our farm, our land, before we were even like farming anything on it, we just were like, we're going to connect this land, we're going to put sort of blanket certification right across it. Um, have everybody, have someone come in every year and certify um, by a traceability and, and oversight that we have not put anything not committable on this land. That's who we were. So we made the brewery organic. We certified the hop yard. We started to grow some of our ingredients, which is quite actually a novel thing here. Do that at all. Um, that suddenly gave our brand something to talk about behind it. So we weren't just this cool yellow handle anymore. We we're this cool yellow handle. We we're from Cape Breton. Nobody else was. We we're on fire. Nobody else was. We were certified organic. Nobody else was. We grew a percentage of our own pots. Nobody else did. There was suddenly a message and a conversation behind our brand nobody else had. And that was not intended. You read our first business plan, that was, none of that was intended. It's just like we did that out of personal philosophy. And it sort of just was suddenly this momentum behind who we were. Um, we, through organic certification and um, through ingredient procurement, always focus on quality. I have a saying now, and, and it's more true than ever, the more breweries we get. Because many breweries, you're getting to that momentum here in the craft beer industry where people, the black person, just don't think are opening breweries for the right reasons or necessarily the right people to be opening breweries are opening them all over the place. So, there's, and there's a difference. And it comes down to this. Well, are you about business or are you about beer? We choose to be about the lot. A lot of places choose to just be about the former. Um, and you can't be just about the former. And generate any kind of following because you just got to have smoke and great beer behind everything you decide to do with brand presence. Um, we have had a commitment to originality. You must, and there's going to be another slide here in a second to talk about differentiation. Um, we have always, you know, again, irony comparison with our original business plan where we thought we'd be two flagship beers. We have blazed the trail. I think if you checked into Untapped and actually counted the number of different beers that Big Spruce has done now, it's in the 50s or 60s. Um, that in, in just four short years. Um, that originality, that diversity of different style has kept people interested in our brand. And that's been a big part of remaining new in the eyes of the, of the most passionate craft beer consumers. We still remain very true to party and cereal filters for our flagship brands. Um, they still sell more than 50% of all the liquid going through our bird. But beside those are a big long laundry list. And now we have a couple other big brands, King's Dirty American and Dirty Dinner India. Um, but we have another big long list of seasonals and one-offs and experimental beers that we do all over the place that really keep people on the edge of their seats wondering what the next thing is that we're going to get involved in. Um, so differentiation. Um, serial killer. That's actually the other thing we got right in our business plan. I knew I had a good sale as a homeowner. And we looked at the market and said, right, there isn't one. There isn't not only a good one, there isn't one brewed year-round. There is no dark craft option 
anywhere in Nova Scotia. Garrison did like a two month seasonal in November. Other than that, nobody brewed one. So we said, gosh, the, the food culture is alive and well, particularly in Halifax. You get all these restaurants that are really into food pairings with beer and that sort of thing, and they don't have a multi dark option, especially in winter. There are many deep serial killer actually sells very well in the summer, too. So by beer style, we were right out of the gate, differentiating ourselves. Uh, then our, our massive, uh, what was a one-day wonder and now it became like a, a seasonal sensation every summer, uh, the silver tart, sour raspberry wheat. So uh, a cattle sour beer that we intentionally inoculate with lactobacillus. We let the lactobacillus grow up in the sweet wort. It uh, causes the pH to dive down as more organisms uh, grow and multiply in there. Um, that creates a very tart flavor in the beer. We then kill the organisms because we boil the beer. But uh, that beer then aged on uh, a few thousand dollars of raspberries for 10 or 15 days. Uh, pink in color, big pink can now out of our new brewery. Um, you know, we can sell 10,000 cans of that in 10 days in the middle of the summer. Um, mostly right out of our door, just people coming and buying it by the case. One guy bought 12 cases. $1,200 for some beer for the beers, loaded into his trunk for him. Um, and then last summer, 100. So we were the first modern era brewery. And I say that cautiously because you never know what folks were doing hundreds of years ago as homesteaders and settlers. Maybe someone was growing their own barley and malting it and uh, cultivating yeast from the wild. We, we think, we know we're the first modern era brewery in Maritimes to brew a, a, a beer 100% from ingredients originating from the province in which we're in. So that beer has rye and barley grown in the valley and malted at Sport and Ridge uh, in uh, Grand Prix. It has our hops um, grown at uh, our, uh, our farm. It has our water. It has a yeast that we spent two years uh, fighting in the wild on our farm. It's living on an eastern, wild eastern Canadian thin cherry along with two other um, yeast organisms. Um, right, we still haven't experimented much with that. Um, and uh, we spent some time uh, testing it, propagating it up, test brewing it, test brewing it more with all sorts of home brewers, um, and finally releasing a beer with it that uh, went along with these 100% uh, notice solution ingredients. First time that anybody's ever done that. Uh, we continue to look for ways to differentiate our brand. And we try to do that with experience. So lots of breweries, they want to they sponsor events. Where they can sell lots of beer. I don't want to sponsor events where I can sell beer. I don't care about the beer. I want to sponsor events or be involved peripherally or somehow in an event where people go away saying they have the best freaking time they've ever had. Experience. People that will associate experience with my beer before drinking lots of my beer is associated with the memory. It's it's the experience that, that counts. So we do, as I already described, these food truck weekends. Five uh, five Four sets of live music, Thursday, Fridays, and Saturdays. Food uh, trucks set up in the parking lot. Food entirely procured from the island of Cape Breton. Um, we'll come to a slide of it in a second. Tag your in. You guys didn't hear about that a couple of one months ago, not even. August 3rd. August 3rd, we released a beer with a very original collaborating partner, Ocean Tracking Network. <laughs> Um, from uh, their, their offices are on uh, Dalhousie campus in the uh, Department of Oceanography or whatever the heck it's called. Um, they uh, they came to us in February looking to partner with a brewery on an idea to create a seasonal beer that featured information on the can about what they do. Um, and when I heard what they did, I was amazed. I was amazed because what they're doing is truly cutting edge. They partnered with a local, right? Local tech sale. Um, local uh, tech, technological North Nova Scotia firm to uh, build these uh, transponders that they are surgically implanting into endangered species in the oceans around Nova Scotia and indeed around the rest of the world. And then they uh, send out both gliders and they position uh, data recorders as buoys and bottom sounders and that sort of thing all around the planet to record where these animals then go and migrate and mate and eat forage. Um, incredible work, you know. And I sat there listening to this team of seven people tell me about what they were doing. I said, 
you do have a problem. I said, I'm about as iffy as I get. Certified organic farm, grow my own food, love the back of the land movement, love to pride myself in reading and knowing a little bit about what's going on environmentally in the province, and I had no idea you existed, despite this big building on Dalhousie campus and all the fine work, and it's spot on the Rick Mercer report that we already had as well, too. And it shows like 300 followers on Twitter. I mean, they're just, they just have, they've got all the work right and none of the branding image right at all. Um, we did this beer with them and it was just crazy. Again, another summer sensation like Silver Tart where people were lined up to get some and indeed line up to get some more. Um, so successful, we're going to do it two more times. We've already got it once in the convention and we'll be out uh, in the next week or the week following. Uh, experiential events. Uh, so back to my point. I don't want to do a tap takeover. Not really. I mean, if, if, if a bar comes to me and really wants to do it, great. But I will have conversations with them about the events that surround the tap takeover. Uh, because I just don't find coming to sample different beers very exciting anymore. It, you can come and do that at my brewery. You can go and do that at lots of other, other bars. It's got to have. Uh, it's got to have a hook. That can get into people and remind them of what we stand for as a brand. So that pig roast we just did on Sunday, um, we uh, on the Sunday of Labor Day weekend every year roast uh, two locally raised, pastor uh, uh, raised uh, pigs on a spit in our parking lot for 24 hours. This year we added 170 pounds of uh, ribs, slow uh, raised, and then uh, uh, roasted ribs. Uh, to the menu, uh, along with about five or six this year, the theme is Tex-Mex, uh, locally uh, produced sides, all the ingredients are locally produced, except for the rice, actually, from the um, that, that was a huge success. We fed 170 people this uh, this past Sunday. Uh, uh, the numbers off the till were, uh, we did 1,480 four-ounce samples, which is about uh, three times what we do on an apoplectic crazy weekend day. Um, we had uh, two bands play. Uh, we set up a tent, so there was lots of shade. We had you know, people literally lounging today. Oh, Highland Bow and Arrow showed up, and we did archery lessons for everybody. We had horseshoes, ring toss. It was just a great, again, sort of bottom of the Yankee line moment where people showed up and really enjoyed the moment, for the music, the food, everything that was going on, and the community around it. That's the sort of thing we want. What we focus on, that will never change. Uh, we love beer experiments as well, too. That's where I really get my primary enjoyment. Um, I'm going to let you guys try something. We did a little barrel experiment two years ago. It was our first barrel aged beer. Uh, it was the one that won Beer of the Year last year at the Atlantic Canadian Beer Awards. Uh, the Rara Rasputin uh, barrel aged Russian Imperial Stout. I've got a Quite a bit too much of it, considering how many people are there. We'll see what we can do with it after this. Um, that was uh, that was like you know that was a no-brainer. I mean, how many breweries get to operate 45 minutes away from distilleries? Literally, and if you ever been, for most of the time, you you might not have seen. Like I'm sure you see the upright barrels in the parking lot all over the place. They have another whole pile of barrels just sitting there outside the distillery, literally in a pot. The first three times we went and picked up barrels, we dumped them out of ice and snow in their parking lot, loaded them onto our van, defrosted them in the brewery, and filled them full of beer. They were literally out for garbage. We went in there and said, no, these, these have all sorts of residual spirits and the walls of evil. They've been used once by Buffalo Trace uh, for bourbon. They've been used a second time, 16, or sometimes 16 years by Lenora. For single malt whiskey, um, we think they'll make a pretty good guy expression of Imperial Stout. And indeed, they've done that. They, they've done uh, code words come again in barrel aged warmer. They've done uh, complexified barrel aged quality port, which we released tomorrow. Um, we've turned a whole business out of really starting to use something that they were casting aside or cutting in half of the chainsaw and selling to people's garden plants. And that's, that's been a truly difference making beer for us. It really put us on the map. That was, I, I don't like beer awards very much. Um, I don't mind the Atlantic Canadian beer awards because 
it's sort of done in conjunction with a more general celebration of beer. I don't like. I don't think we should be judging beer. I think we should be celebrating beer. Um, but it was nice to get that one because that beer was so. It was so us. It was barrels from down the road. It was a beer we explored and experimented with for the very first time, and it did that. There's that uh, that label that's on the can for tag you're in. So again, whole other side of our business. You know, this was this was the first draft of the logo. Like just two people from the PR department of Ocean Tracking Network, my artist and me, sat at a table, back of a napkin, sketched the big spruce tree in the jaws of a four beetle shark. One of twelve species of sharks that frequent waters off in Nova Scotia. Pretty ferocious little bastard too. <laughs> uh, they're like five to eight foot size, but kind size great whites. Lots of fun and very endangered. Very endangered. Um, Fifty cents of every can. So we did. We've already done about uh, did about uh, eight thousand six hundred cans on the first run. So forty three hundred bucks is already uh, earmarked to go into their efforts. Uh, we're doing a second and a third run. Uh, here's going to be featured at a major uh, conference that they're holding in Halifax the end of October, mid to late October, uh, where 1,500 delegates from all over the planet are going to get a welcome bag that has two cans of this in it. Um, pretty cool side of creativity for a business. You know, shining through on a, on a plan of cans. Beer dinners. We have this great space. We try not to work on Sundays. So five, for five Sundays in the summer, we sold out 20 seats for five nights. 100 people got to have a five-course meal. And actually, with two surprise courses with the meals, it was actually a seven-course meal. Uh, those dates for 75 bucks, and your uh, uh, beer tastings and pairings were included for every course as well. Again, experiential, difference making. Freaking cool to sit in a brewery and meal. Beer and yoga. Another thing we do every Saturday at the at the brewery. Uh, one hour of yoga and four samples of beer up on the patio afterwards. Uh, and if you're happy to be there on a day where we still got a lot of mist fills from a from a canning run, you can probably have a can or two sitting on your yoga mat as you do yoga. So that's a cool picture that someone that's a big fan of craft beer in Nova Scotia. So uh, kind of illustrating. You know, some of it go back. I just love what that picture says. I mean, it's a great picture. Okay, so first of all, it's a great picture of our brand or can. But I just look at that and go, man, somebody worked really hard to think about that, and then subsequently take that picture and put the equipment to bear. I know phones are pretty sensitive now, and you can probably just do that with a phone. But just everything about it—the moment on the field, the yellow buttercups was just right. See the badge, our brand, and everything. You would have thought there was all sorts of branding and everything else behind it. No, that's just a passion. A guy who loves craft beer and loves big screws. And now that's a postcard that we sell at the uh, front desk as well. So that's all I have other than beer. <laughs> I would love to share a little bit of my uh, Russian Imperial Stout with you guys. I can't have much because I've got to go back to my hands. Got any questions? I'm happy to. Answer them. I'm happy to mingle afterwards, whatever you want to do. How did you come up with the name? How did I come up with the name? I came up with it the same night I came up with Serial Killer, uh, just standing on my deck. We had, we had we had a first incarnation of a different name for the brewery that was frowned upon by a major regional brewery. It's named after my client, Canadian animal. <laughs> um, and uh, I just decided we were we were going to call ourselves the Tilted Moose, and uh, we had even had a funky logo all done up for that. Um, and uh, Moose had reached out sort of unofficially and said that it was it was not something they were going to allow. And I, in fact, researched that they sort of had four or five cases where they taken people who never actually gone to court, but they had uh, fought against uh, the use of. Of, of moose, even uh, with a coffee company, because the pop the coffee company was called uh, Java Moose Brewing Company, because they used the word brewing, they didn't want any misunderstanding, so they 
Java Moose in Brunswick pays a royalty to Moose Head Brewing Company for the use of the word moose. And I find that bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how you can own full entitlement to an iconic Canadian animal like a moose. I think it would be worth fighting one day, but I wasn't going to be that. I wasn't, I wasn't going to be the David that I thought it. You know, it was literally a case of uh, I bet the farm on a business, and I wasn't going to use all my revenues. They, they clearly, you know, trademark mark law is whoever has the biggest war chest, and uh, it wasn't going to be me. Never would be. So we got off the name immediately, and that night on the deck, I stood there looking at this massive spruce tree that sits in the brook behind my house, and I was like, "It's pretty fun." What we call ourselves. Just going to buy them someday. What's that? Just buy them someday. Uh, <laughs> there you go. There we go. Here we go. They're, they're in an interesting spot. Who's that brewing? Um, Canada's North America's only medium sized, completely privately owned, independently operated um, brewery. They're, they're in a very interesting spot. Because it's really like Sap Miller and AD InBev, all of us, and then only Moosehead, right? Right in between. Yeah. Only for the So, yeah, had the bones down and so on. Really, it's an option. So, you want to be the other. Trying to go for it. Uh, first, I'd just like to congratulate you. I think you're both that far from a religion. <laughs> I'm going to vote for you, run politically, and I'm going to drink your beer. So, right no, on. seriously, I think you're awesome. <laughs> Where do you grow a lot of your own ingredients and you had such a quick growth? Was it a challenge to keep up with? It was a challenge. You know what? Very admittedly, we haven't we haven't kept up with the demand yeah. for our own ingredients. Yeah. We've gone from 30% of our own of our hops were our own hops. Yeah. Uh, with the new brewery now, that's gonna fall to less than five or something. Yeah. Um, we're trying to make up for it with ethical procurement from uh, maritime growing hops. Um, we're still the only organic grower though, so we have to um, get variance permission from our certifier before we can, before we can buy from that. It's, it's a complex procedure and it's, it's still not perfect, but everything, even hop growing is still in its interest. So we're hoping to get that. Do you think some of that